Okay, uh, straight into it then. Um, so, good evening everyone, uh, thanks for coming along. Um, I'm going to do a session, as you can quite capably read for yourselves, on uh, building scalable applications with Heroku. Um, so, just a very brief show of hands, who, who here has actually even heard of Heroku and who hasn't? So, let's do the has. Let's do that, let's do the has. Okay, that's, that's very encouraging, that's very encouraging. Um, well, hopefully, um, you, you've been promised a deep dive. It's, 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 it's as deep as I can go in about 25 minutes. Um, but I'm going to look at some of the tools and techniques um, for kind of scaling it, making it uh, enterprise grade, whatever, whatever your definition of that is, um, and, and see how we do it in a Heroku world. And it's not going to the next slide because technology. What have I done? Yeah. yeah, the presentation hasn't scaled, or certainly <laughs> PowerPoint hasn't. Switch it off and on. There we go, there we go. So yeah, who, who, who the hell am I and why am I talking about Heroku? Um, so as is traditional, a bit of an introduction about myself, um, so you can all read. Um, but basically, uh, I'm an independent Salesforce consultant, um, working currently as a, a technical architect, a network security and antivirus company, thanks to... My, my agent here, had to give him a shout out. Um, as you can see on the, uh, on the slide there, been around the Salesforce and Heroku ecosystem for a little while, um, doing bits of end user, bits of consultancy, um, bit with uh, some Salesforce Platinum partners as well. Um, mostly Salesforce, little bits of Heroku here and there, um, but because uh, I'm completely sad, I, I've done some Heroku in my spare time as well. I've got a little site called swapmyswag.com. So if you've got three of the same sticker and someone else has got three of the same sticker and you want to trade it in, drop by the site and uh, I'm sure you can hook something up there. <laughs> no, stickers, plushies, t-shirts, coffee mugs, water bottles. Um, some people, how dare they, have started loading some non-Salesforce swag on there now. <laughs> I know, who'd have thought it? Uh, okay, so. What is Heroku, and why, why are my crib sheets not loading properly? Um, so, if you look at the official definition, Heroku is a cloud platform that lets companies build, deliver, monitor, and scale apps. Well, so does Salesforce, so does AWS, so does Azure. So, what actually, behind the scenes, outside of the marketing speak, is Heroku? So, under the hood, Heroku is a, a collection of little Linux instances called Dynos. Uh, that have been kind of tuned for, for scaling and performance. Now these little dynos can be, uh, have different process types. There can be a web process, um, which as the name suggests is your sort of visible web-based front end that the world sees. Um, so for example, if uh, people are sending lots of web requests and you need to render the site, that's going to be a web process. They also have worker processes or worker dynos. Um, and these are the, the, the engine effectively. If you think of the web dynos as, as the bodywork, then the, the worker dynos are, are going to be your engine. It's doing all the business logic, the processing, the calling out to databases and other web services. So the way that Heroku allows you to do that is you can create lots and lots and lots of these. So if you think of them as like little worker bees, so a little worker bee will have its task and it'll go away and fly and, and do what it needs to do, but you really get the benefit of that when they swarm. Okay. Um, and it becomes greater than the sum of its parts. So if you're looking at the, the diagram there, which from this angle is really hard to see, um, all those dynos sit on top of something called the logplex. The logplex is responsible for kind of orchestrating all of this um, and collating and distributing the log entries that each of these processes generates. Um, and then you get a log stream, which you can then subscribe to and do all your monitoring um, off the back of that. So that's kind of architecturally um, how Heroku is, is put together. Um, in terms of how you get it to run these processes, Heroku allows you to use a lot of different uh, languages. Um, most of these languages are, are those languages that have some variant of open source um, licensing around them. So to the best of my knowledge, and uh, please feel free to correct, but I, I don't think you'll find .NET uh, implementations on Heroku at the moment. 
um, unless someone's doing something clever with Mono. Um, but things like Java, Ruby, Python, Node.js, Clojure, and, and those type of languages that have sprung up from the open source community um, are heavily supported on Heroku. There's also a, a big ecosystem, much like the App Exchange, um, of uh, additional packages and extensions for most of the tasks that you're going to need on there. Uh, oh, look, you're killing me. Oh, no, PowerPoint, you're killing me here. Uh, is it going to go to this slide? Yeah. I should have taken up your offer of the clicker here. It works on my screen. Changing on mine, but not on. Oh, it's changing on here. There we go. I've got it now. I've got it now. Yeah. Cool. So, why do you need Heroku? So, Heroku is definitely not a replacement for Salesforce. So, it's something that in your organizations might possibly, maybe, be a good choice of, uh, to supplement your development for offloading some of those bigger processing tasks or. Uh, some of those external web-facing tasks um, that you'd struggle to scale out on Salesforce appropriately. So some of the advantages of Heroku is you don't have your Apex governor limits. Yes, there kind of are some limits, not the cheapest. So yeah, no governor limits, no API limits, no SQL limits, all the things that frustrate us as developers and architects on the Salesforce platform, uh, you have a little bit more free reign on there. We've already talked about the programming languages. You have a wide suite of, um, of supported languages on the platform. Um, the advantage to that, of course, is if you have an incumbent development team within your organizations that are already using those languages on uh, other platforms, those skill sets become portable and, and move across. Um, and there's a lot of specialist uh, add-ons and, and ecosystem around that. Some of them are official Heroku products. Some of them are third parties. So, the three that I've listed there, Postgres is your relational database. Heroku Connect is uh, a means of interfacing uh, bi-directionally to Salesforce. And Heroku Kafka is a, an enterprise-grade message bus, which we'll talk about a bit more shortly. I can never get both of the screens to move at the same time. OK, so hopefully I'll have more success with a, a quick demo than I will with PowerPoint. Um, let's see what we can do. So what I'm going to quickly demo is how quick and easy it is um, to, to get a Heroku application deployed. And if I try, will it let me stop presenting? <coughs> Technology. I should have used Linux like, uh, like Todd did. Let's see if we can kill that and bring up. That one. No. It's going really well. I should do it again at a big conference like uh, London's Calling or something. Okay, I'm just going to completely kill PowerPoint and start it up again in a minute. So, there we go. Command line. Familiar territory. Um, so. Um, this is the Windows subsystem for Linux on Windows 10 running the ZSH shell. But that's not important right now. <laughs> uh, I need to know how to get those effects. When you have it. Oh, oh, this? That's a Z shell. Yeah, that's, that's using hyperterminal. Uh, anyway, we're getting very distracted as, as all developers <laughs> do. Oh, look, it's pretty. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, I actually turned some of the effects off for, for the same reason. So. Uh, am I in the right folder? Yes. Uh, no, not that one. Heroku demo. There we go. So, here's one I prepared. It. I actually made a little uh, script to, to run this out, um, but you'll see, hopefully, what the steps are that it's taking. So, we're going to get the Git repo and hope that the Wi Fi holds up. There we go. Then we have changed into that directory and we're creating a new application on Heroku and we're pushing that repository to Heroku. So it, it's gone a heck of a lot quicker than I was expecting to. So I'll probably, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it never works this easily. Um, so yeah, 
There's a, an example repository on GitHub called Java Getting Started, which is part of the, uh, the, the Heroku example set. So I've cloned that repository. I've changed directory into that repository. I've done Heroku create um, and then give it an application name, which is effectively saying create a new application under my Heroku account uh, with this name. Hello. For me to run Heroku create, do I need to download some sort of CLI? Yes. Yes, exactly that. <laughs> well done. Um, I told you it was here. Here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so yes, I um, created a new Heroku application with the, the aforementioned CLI, uh, which is downloadable from the Heroku website. Uh, if any of you are using Salesforce DX, it's the same kind of shtick as that. You know, it's, it's download the CLI, run it from the command line, it creates the application for you. Uh, I've created that application. That application uh, will automatically um, be tracked on Git, uh, sorry, on Heroku's Git repository as well, and then I just push it up there. So now, if I do Heroku open, I know there's an update. What? Oh, hang on, I'm not in the right folder, am I? Heroku. I tried to do an update on the onboard train Wi-Fi on the way here, and it just wasn't happening. I thought, I'm not going to break the demo. What should happen is it will fire up a Chrome. What's actually happening is it's pondering it. OK, let's cross over that. Um, but what, what should happen? and I'm not entirely sure why, is when you do Heroku open, when you create the Heroku application, it gets a unique URL on the herokuapp.com domain, which is where Heroku apps are installed by default, especially if you're using the free tiers like I'm doing for this demo. Um, and then it, that gets associated with that application. You do Heroku open, and it should fire up a browser and, and run all that. Uh, that, that was because um, uh, I wasn't in the application directory. If you're in the right directory for the app, it assumes a default of the application that's associated with my current folder slash repository. Um, in fact, what we could do, uh, that's the dip there, Lundev test. Let's try that. There we go. I got there a different way, but effectively, um, yes, it's, it's spun up a Her Heroku instance on herokuapp.com which you can see up there. Um, it's just the vanilla example. I've made zero changes to that. I've literally just cloned the repository um, and spun up an instance. Um, there was lots to read on that. Um, yeah, clone the same repo. I'll put some links up later, um, and you can explore to your heart's content. And I've just chosen Java because it's my historical weapon of choice for Heroku apps. You could equally have done the same with, with Node, Clojure, Python, etc., etc. So, demo complete. That's a load off my mind. If we can only get PowerPoint to work successfully. That's looking a lot better. Right, where did I get to? Demo. Okay, we've done the demo. Little guy in the car is happy. So, scaling then. So, title of the talk um, is... is includes the word scalable. So let's talk a little bit about how we scale those. So with Heroku, because everything is in these little packaged dynos, you've kind of got two ways to scale it. You can make bigger dynos. You can throw more memory, more CPU. Um, you, know, you, can, you can effectively have a bigger computer running your stuff. Or you can have more little dynos and spread the load sideways. Um, so. The terminology for this is, is horizontal versus vertical scaling. Um, the idea being that if you've got a, a big long running job, it's better to get a bigger dyno because it can churn through that job a lot quicker and, and return the results faster. If you've got a scalability issue where it's doing a tiny little job, but it's doing it many, 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 many times because everyone's hitting your site with requests, it's better to scale up to have more dynos. That's largely um, the approach that there are other models, uh, but I think that's probably the, the most simplified model. Um, with that, uh, as the saying goes, with much power comes much responsibility. 
the responsibility of your dynos is that each dyno shouldn't need to know or depend upon any activity or state from any of the other dynos. Okay? It, it should be able to run independently. It should be able to spin up and shut down on demand without leaving any cruft behind. You know, it should be a nice, uh, solid, stable unit. Uh, I think that's kind of the key to, to scaling on, uh, on Heroku. Additionally, uh, we talked about the, the add-on ecosystem, and, and this is where um, you, know, you can really extend your application. You've got uh, a choice of back-end storage, be that traditional relational databases, um, the, the, the NoSQL key data stores, um, and a whole bunch of other things that they can come up with. Um, you've got caches like uh, Redis and Memcache. Um, you've got better log processors. You've got things that will handle your email engine. You know, there's a whole bunch of things that, when you're building a, a modern, scalable web application, you need to think, oh, how am I going to solve that? Oh, actually, someone's already built that. I'll just plug it in. Um, to give you an example, the, the uh, Swap My Swag site I mentioned earlier uses Heroku Postgres for its uh, back-end data storage. It uses Paper Trail for its log management. Um, it uses SendGrid for sending out emails. And then it uses Cloudinary for image management and, and sort of general image asset uh, handling. Are these, um, are these paid for or free or is there a So much like Heroku itself, um, most of the providers, if not all, tend to take a tiered model to it. So there is a free tier because as a developer, you want to try out a few different things and say, okay, this is the best tool. You know, there, there are five different, uh, you know, as an example, there are five different log management tools. I want to know which one actually best fits my need. I want to try before I buy. Um, there's, there's free tiers. And then it scales up depending on, mostly depending on volume. I think most of the, is, is most of the model there. So we've talked a bit about scale and about how to sort of scale the dynos horizontally and vertically. But what if you need to go even larger? This is where we come into something like Heroku Kafka. So we've got a, the, the official description there, um, but you can largely think about it for, you know, for some of the sort of the old hands at sort of enterprise applications, it's your enterprise message bus. Um, so probably akin to things like uh, Tibco, I think is probably another good example of, of uh, a competing product. The advantage of having it on Heroku is, is twofold. One is Heroku will uh, have kind of built that for you um, and will manage that for you. They will tune it, optimize it. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's an official supported product. It's not even a, a third party ecosystem add-on. So not only do you not have to build it yourself, but you get the same level of uh, support for that as you would for the rest of Heroku. Uh, for those of you kind of unfamiliar with the, the concept of the, uh, the message bus, um, the, the message bus is effectively managing messages, as the name suggests, so a bit like, uh, for example, platform events. A message consists of, of three uh, key pieces of information. So there's the context, the operation, and the state. So the context is, uh, okay, what is the message? Where did the message come from? When, when did it happen? The operation is, oh, okay, what's the message telling me to do? You know, is it an update? Is it an insert? Is it a delete? Is it something completely different? Um, it's effectively, it's, it's the what part of it. So the context is the, the, the when and where. The operation is the what. Um, and then the state is like, well, okay, what, what's the supporting data? You know, you want me to delete something, you better tell me what, it, what you want me to delete. Um, you know, what's the unique identifier of that? So to continue, uh, you know, the, we, we've, we've done the, the when and the where, we've done the what, and the state is, the, is, is largely the how. Um, but the advantage of doing it through Kafka is, is um, it is scalable in, in a similar sort of model. You can have multiple, um, Kafka brokers, which are, are in the context of the Heroku uh, piece, is largely equivalent to the, the dynos. It's a, a discrete packaged instance that's handling those messages and, and acting upon them. Uh, secondly, um, it's queuable. So, you know, if, if you are under heavy load, it's not going to forget about them. Um, it runs uh, sequentially 
it's repeatable and replayable as well. Um, so you've kind of got this um, organized, managed way of acting upon your operations in time. Much like platform events on, on Salesforce, um, you know, it's a, a publisher subscriber model. So you can have multiple listeners, multiple things subscribing to your platform events. And equally on Kafka, it'll support multiple publishers. So you've really got this um, architecture for, for uh, designing a system that works on that whole sort of publisher subscribe mechanism um, in a strong, robust way. So to give some examples of, of where you'd use events and, and what type of thing you'd want to put on your uh, Kafka event stream, uh, you know, here's just a sort of handful of examples, you know, real world examples that you think, oh, actually, no, that, that makes sense now. That's a real world use case. So product views. So you want to, you know, queue up, um, you know, hits on the website to view a particular product, query it out of the database. Completed sales pipelines, page visits, logging. Logging is a very popular use case for um, event streaming. Shipping notification. I mean, you know, as I said earlier, you can all read. Um, but yeah, it's, think of it in terms of, you know, a, a constant sort of fire hose of data coming from your systems. Um, then, you know, Kafka is your way of, of managing the torrent. It's, it's a way of, I wouldn't say slowing down because it is very fast, but it's a way of, of being able to, to manage it in a timely, effective way in the right order, in the right sequence, um, and not just get overwhelmed with your data feeds. Um, there is a bit of overlap with things like uh, platform events or, or the Salesforce IoT cloud for some of those use cases. I mean, we've got it, IoT sensor values and, and weather data there. Um, yes, there is overlap. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those fantastic cases that you get with Salesforce where they give you several different ways to, to solve a problem. And then you can kind of look at, well, which one actually best fits our, our technical needs, our business needs, um, our bank balances, you know. That, that there's a few considerations with, with Salesforce's product offerings there. So is this like a, uh, sort of a message bus, or is it like WebMQ, or is it something more than that? Um, yeah, it's in, a, it's in a similar space to that, um, but it's, it's more about the, the scalability. So with, with RabbitMQ, you have a, a RabbitMQ instance, whereas with, with Kafka, it's it's kind of a layer of abstraction above that. So if you can think of it, uh, you know, if you had a, a RabbitMQ server on AWS, for example, and it was struggling to cope with the capacity and the load, you'd spin up another RabbitMQ instance and load balance it and, you know, orchestrate it so that, um, you know, it was sharing that load. With, with Kafka, Kafka is the thing that allows you to do that sharing as well as uh, the, the, the message queue, message bus piece as well. So it's kind of a, a broader context, um, all-in-one uh, solution for, for, for handling that type of scenario. Um, we'll go into a little bit of, of how it actually does that. Um, so the fundamental concept is that it acts as a broker for these messages. Um, that said, you, know, you, you can have more than one broker, uh, and you can kind of scale up and down as you need to. Um, so that the brokers receive the messages from producers. The terminology is a little different to the, the publish, subscribe. They call it producers and consumers. Um, but you, you can kind of see the, the, the direct mapping there. Um, so those messages are, are grouped into topics. So you can kind of subscribe to a topic, um, which gives you like a, a logical grouping around what types of messages you're interested in. Um, and then the, the topics contain one or more partitions. Uh, Bear with me on the terminology. Uh, I've got a, a, a little bit of a, a helper on there, but uh, I didn't choose the names. Um, but the, top, the partitions can then allow a topic to be broken down. So that, for example, multiple producers and, and consumers can all contribute to the same uh, topic, and then that topic can be grouped together into partitions. So it's effectively the idea is that they're trying to get not just the, the, the technical underpinnings and the architecture very distributed, but the data model and the way that they structure and, and schema things up um, is very distributed as well. It lends itself much better to, to parallel processing and, and scaling that. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not just a, a technical scaling, but it's a, a, a data architecture scaling as well. 
So, demos again. Not happening. Um, Heroku Kafka is a paid offering. That, that there, as much as I'd like to, uh, to, to give you a quick demo of how Kafka works, uh, the budget doesn't stretch to it. But, as you can see from the link there, that there's a good demo um, that gives a, a, a bit of a sort of structured overview of how that works. Um, and there's, there's going to be some more useful links at the end. Um, yeah, Phil, I'll, I'll, I'll hold that up a quick bit if anyone else wanted to take a quick picture of that link or anything. Be good? Cool. Okay. Um, so all this is great, and you've got your scalable enterprise architecture, and you know, you've, you've made sure it's robust, and it's handling all your messages and, and whatnot. But then you know, your client or your employer or whoever you're, you're, you're managing the, the cloud for, they say, well, that's great, but what's that got to do with Salesforce? We plug it into Salesforce optionally. So uh, Salesforce slash Heroku have a product offering called Heroku Connect. It's not free. Um, you know, set expectations very early here. It's not free and it's not cheap. But what it does give you, if you're using Heroku Postgres as your back-end data store for your Heroku application, so it's a strong, robust, scalable, relational database in the cloud, as you'd expect. So if you're using that particular choice of back-end data store, then there is an automatic, configurable, by admins even, <gasps> shock horror, um, but it, it's point-and-click configuration of, of field mappings and, uh, and, and connectivity um, to connect that database into an equivalent object model in Salesforce, and it's bi-directional, backwards and forwards. It doesn't count to your API limits. So yes, it, it counts towards your bank balance, heavily, um, but from, a, from a, a techie's perspective, you don't have to worry about API governor limits. Um, it's a little moot now, now that uh, uh, Amnon has, has revealed that we now have much bigger API limits, um, but it's, it's still nice to have. And you know, at the, at the uh, point that I created this deck, um, before that API limit increase was announced, it was a big win. Um, you know, being able to, to move data in and out of Salesforce into a and other system um, without worrying about your API limits. Also, it kind of had, I, I'm, I'm loath to call it AI, but it is, it is quite intelligent in terms of how it uses those uh, platform APIs. So what it does is it, it's optimized to kind of make a, an informed decision on which data API in Salesforce to use whether it wants to use the, the bulk API or the REST API. Generally, what happens is it'll use the, the REST API to size up how much data it, it's potentially going to need to transfer. And then, based on certain thresholds, it will say, actually, I can do the rest of this over REST API, no pun intended, or actually, I'm going to need to flip over to the bulk API. So it, it uses that REST API optimally to work out actually, you know, what's the best way of transferring this data? Um, so you, you get that kind of degree of efficiency out of the box. Um, again, you know, not having the API limit um, means it, it doesn't really matter from a limit perspective, but in terms of carrying out things efficiently and quickly um, in, a, in a timely fashion, it's, that's a great help. Um, and as I've mentioned, you know, the, the, uh, the setup of this is, is declarative. It's point and click. It's like this field on Postgres is equivalent to this field on this object, and you can set up all the mapping, and away you go. A bit like if you've, you've ever used the data import wizard. It's kind of look and feels a little bit like that. Um, and there's a whole trailhead module on it if you're so inclined. Yeah, so uh, if you're adding a new field to either side of the equation, you just go into your configuration for Heroku Connect, you'd hit refresh just to pull the, the, the data definitions of, of those fields on both sides, and then you can just add that mapping in. It's, it's not like locked in one time on setup and then you can never change it. Okay, so other factors for designing at scale. 
Heroku are proponents of what they call the 12 factor application. Um, there is a article um, written by one of the Heroku founders um, that kind of defines a lot of these um, of things, you know, architectural decisions um, and, and design principles um, that you should endeavor to adhere to if you're designing a, a Heroku app that needs to scale in the enterprise. Um, it's worth looking up, A, because it, it uh, puts up some very good architectural points, and secondly, if you have a good Google for it, there's actually someone that's done a, uh, a counter-argument for, for some of those principles, which allows you to get a, a, a much more balanced view on it. Um, and there's, there's a 15 factor, and yeah. You could go down a bit, a bit of a rabbit hole, but I think, you know, from what I've seen of the, the original 12 factor principles, they are very solid. Uh, I'm not going to run through all of them. Um, the, the slides will be up on the, um, on the usual channels for the, for the dev group, but I do want to sort of call out a few of them. So dependencies, number two on the list. Um, don't assume that your target environment has got everything you need. Bake in those requirements. And by baking in, I mean not including them and having a, a deployment package that's just astronomically huge. I mean setting up, uh, you know, instantiation scripts that will go and, and fetch uh, any dependencies it needs. Don't assume that it's already on the, the target environment of your code. Okay, you need to make sure that there's no assumptions there. Uh, processes. Uh, so store information in a, in a backing service, uh, you know, like a, a database or a, a NoSQL data key store or whatever, that everything can see. So if you've got multiple dynos, they all need to be sharing that same backing store to preserve that state, okay? So be very modular about this. Uh, port binding, so very low level networky stuff. Um, but the idea is that, you know, just like the, the backing services databases that you're connecting to over the wire, your entire application should interface over the wire. So everything should be a, a call from this component to that component um, and, and be reachable through a, a URL mechanism. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of the, I've got one more. So concurrency. So by, by, because you've got all these little discrete parts working independently and running them as separate, separate processes, your application is going to scale better because you, you've spread that load. But in order to be able to do that concurrently by adding additional servers or additional CPU or RAM or additional dynos or you know, whatever uh, approach you're taking, and this is very Heroku agnostic view on it when we talk about CPUs and RAM and servers, you know, take advantage of, of that architecture, you know, make sure that, um, you know, you've got these small independent processes um, that aren't consuming all the resource um, of that system because you're going to struggle for scale again. But, you know, it doesn't need that, you know, you can run it smaller and accept the responsibility that it's going to run a bit slower. Um, but don't make that, uh, you know, too much of a dependency. Um, and disposability is, is probably the last one I'll pick up on that. Make sure that you, you're always going to shut down gracefully. Um, because when you look at uh, a dynamic or, or elastic scaling model, um, which is one of the things that Heroku is very good at, you know, if you're getting high demand because you've got a, a sale on in your retail environment, for example, you want to scale up more dynos to meet that demand. When that sale's over and you're back to normal traffic, you want to scale them back down again because the more dinos you've got, the more it's costing you. Um, and there, there are things out there that will do the, the, the automatic scaling based on demand and, you know, you set a threshold. And it says, well, actually, I've hit that threshold. I probably ought to spin up another dyno. Um, so you want to be able to gracefully shut down because otherwise if you're left with sort of remnants and inconsistent save states and what have you, then when you scale back down, you know, you, you run a risk of, of losing things. So, uh, mindful of the clock, uh, things that we haven't got time to cover, because there's a whole lot more to, uh, to Heroku. So, Heroku Redis is, a, is another one that's, that's run by Heroku in the same way as Heroku Postgres, Heroku Connect, etc. Um, it's an in-memory key value data store, so it's like your, your caching layer. It's very, very fast. Um, and again, much like any of these add-ons that have got the word Heroku on the front of them, they run it, they manage it, um, you know, it's a fully supported product. Uh, Heroku Enterprise, um, so the word enterprise being a synonym for way more expensive. Um, 
But when, when you need that extra level of, of compliance and assurance and, and tick all the, the, the enterprise boxes, um, you know, you need to start looking at Hen Heroku Enterprise. You know, the, the uh, standard tiers are on a, a shared architecture. So, um, you know, it's much like the multi-tenant model that we're all used to with Salesforce. With Heroku Enterprise, you can optionally add in something called private spaces, which is dedicated instances. Um, you have Heroku Enterprise Teams, so you have this hierarchical administrative structure. So say, well, okay, we have got seven Heroku applications. You know, I am the enterprise architect, I oversee all of them. You're a development team working on only two of those projects. You only have access to those two pieces of our Heroku platform within our organization. Um, Heroku Shield, because they love using the word shield on everything, um, that's your, your uber compliant um, layer that's compliance with all the various uh, certifications like HIPAA, PCI, um, and all those kind of uh, industry specific um, requirements that have you know, additional layers of, um, I wouldn't say complexity, but additional layers of assurance and security and stuff to meet those standards. Um, SSO for Heroku, you're going to get with, with Enterprise. Uh, Routing and pairing with virtual private clouds. That's effectively just making sure that you have this sort of interconnect between AWS or, or Google Cloud um, and Heroku and, and can do the handoffs and that in a secure fashion. So these are all what they deem as enterprise grade uh, functionalities, which largely makes sense because you know, I think as a hobbyist, you're probably not going to care as much about all of those features. Um, and and the, the free tiers of serving, I've actually used the free tiers for enterprise production applications before because it was an app, you know, they're applications that don't need all of these features. You know, it's comparatively low usage. I think one application I did at uh, Ticketmaster, the only additional cost was we just needed a few more database rows. So we paid $9 a month, I think it was, for um, the next tier up of Heroku Postgres versus an 80,000 a year application that they were looking at. We just rolled our own and stuck a slightly more expensive database on it. You know, nine dollars a year, that's like half a beer in San Francisco. Oh, sorry, nine dollars a year, nine dollars a month, yeah. Um, the aforementioned useful links, um, I've, I've kind of grouped them all together. Uh, there's lots more to explore on Heroku. There's the Heroku Dev Center, which is uh, the, the home of all official documentation on Heroku. Heroku's creeping into Trailhead, um, they're certainly upscaling um, the content on Trailhead to, to not just be Salesforce platform. There's a lot more Heroku stuff on there now. Um, Heroku Kafka, um, just a deeper dive on that. There's a certification now, um, the Heroku Architecture Designer Certification. Um, it came out in beta early last year. A handful of people got it. Um, I didn't get on the beta program. I had to pay for it. I had a crack at it. I didn't get it, but only just. Um, but yeah, there is, a, there is a certification. So if you really want to sort of, um, you know, start exploring on Heroku um, and, and prove that you know what you're on about, that's the one to go for. Uh, there's a YouTube video um, that kind of covers some of the scenarios and gives a, a, a great use case and, and reference architecture for some of that. It uses uh, Kafka, so it ties together Heroku Connect and Kafka and a few of the pieces there. Um, and then finally, just a link for preparation on that aforementioned examination, if you really want to run with this. So if everyone's managed to capture the links, and again, you know, the video will go up, the, the slide deck will get shared, so don't worry if you haven't managed to capture those. And with that, we'll try and capture some questions, if there are any. Yes? It is exactly similar to, to AWS on the grounds that Heroku behind the scenes is running on AWS um, still. I don't think it's available on all AWS instances. Not, it's, it's, it's not on all instances, but it, it has the same uh, yeah. continental spread, shall we say, as AWS. So you've got an Asia pack, you've got a North America, you've got some Europe, you know, and, you know, uh, environment one, environment two of, of, of those, etc. So, yeah, um, yeah, that's a, that's a good point, actually. Yes, Heroku is running on top of AWS, uh, and a lot of people will say, why don't we just do it on AWS? Because the amount of effort that you need to build 
things on AWS is greater than having it as a managed service, for want of a better expression, on Heroku. You know, it's, Heroku sits in this wonderful middle space between AWS and Salesforce. So Salesforce is very prescriptive. It's their multi-tenant environment. You know, you're working on the Salesforce platform. You know, you do, if you're writing code, you're writing it in Apex or, or Lightning components and what have you. Um, you know, you don't have a choice of databases or, or, or logging servers and whatnot. So it's, it's, it's more freedom than Salesforce, but then it's less effort than AWS. And, you know, AWS is, 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 is quite different now. You've got, you know, your serverless containers and your, uh, your Lambda expressions. You know, it, it, the barriers to entry are less. But if you think about the original incarnations of AWS, you know, you'd stand up an EC2 server, um, you know, you'd have to configure that server, install your applications, install your database, configure your database. It's a, Heroku does a lot of that heavy lifting for you. So you can focus on developing applications, not servers. That's kind of the, the USP of, of Heroku. It's, you know, it's AWS without the, the server admin, effectively. I think AWS has made a lot of advances. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Back of Heroku. Yeah. The idea is they've got a CLI now where you can spin up instances, things like Docker and Kubernetes. It's changed the game a bit. I think it's a much harder decision now. But Heroku is still nicer to use. From a developer perspective, yeah. For anyone that just doesn't want to yeah. write a Docker file. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. I mean, you, you saw there, right? I, I cloned a repository, moved into the directory, created a Heroku instance, Git push. I mean, you know, if you're not, if you're not using Git push or, or subversion in deference to my friend at the back there who's still stuck with subversion. Um, but yeah, if, you, if, you, if you're not in that kind of model of a, uh, as a developer of check out some code, make some changes, commit it again, um, you know, then you, you might struggle with that concept. But largely, that's the model of Heroku. Heroku deployments are a Git push. And then it just, you know, it has Git hooks that, that stand that up in your, in your system. Um, so, you know, as a, as a path to getting your application out there, it's very quick and very easy. Gentlemen at the front. You mentioned that it gets expensive, but what are these bills like? Is it 80, 80 pounds, 800 pounds? For the, what type of apps have you seen? Uh, that's a difficult one, uh, in so much as you know, my experience on the expensive apps is, is limited. So, um, at, at the risk of a shameless plug here, uh, my, my little hobbyist swapmyswag.com, um, I need, I, with the free tier, it, it spins up and spins down on demand, which means that when you make that first request, if it's not really spun up, you, there's a little lead time. I didn't want that, so I, I opted to pay for the, uh, I think they call it the hobby tier. Um, so, uh, it's a little bit more robust, but even at that sort of entry level, you know, side project thing, I think it's costing me $7 a month. Okay. So that's, I mean, you know, for, for experimentation and exploring, yeah, nice and cheap. When you get to the enterprise scale, however, um, you know, especially if you're using uh, the Heroku Enterprise product that gives you all those, um, you know, stronger grade compliance and security features, then, you know, in, much like everything else, sales will speak to your account exec. But yeah, I, you know, I'll be honest, there are people that have migrated away from Heroku back down to AWS, absorbed the hit of, okay, we've got to rebuild a lot of stuff now. And as Richard has said, you know, they've closed the gap between AWS and Heroku from a, a, a development standpoint. But anecdotally, the, the cost savings uh, is what's driven that decisioning. Yes, you can. Yeah. We don't really have a thing similar to that. I've been in situations where we had an AWS instance. One of our developers decided to use it for his own personal projects, which we didn't know until we got the AWS bill at the end of the month for um, three and a half thousand dollars. So yeah, that wouldn't have happened with Heroku. Yeah. And uh, Heroku Connect isn't cheap, is it? Heroku Connect isn't cheap. So it's it's a trade off, right? So. Uh, um, no. no. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's not something that I'm, I'm going to stand up here and say, you know, migrate everything to Heroku. It's freaking awesome. You know, it, it, it's the savior of the world. You know, it needs to be an informed decision. It needs to be something that you have up your sleeve as a solution. So, you know, for, for those of you that are um, in the sort of senior dev architect sphere where you're, you're proposing, recommending, designing solutions, you know, it's you know, another tool in your toolbox. 
um, to, to, you know, it, it might be that it's, it's good for hammering that nail, but not so good for loosening that bolt. You know, it's, it's just something that you, you have to size up as, is this the best weapon of choice? Um, but that said, you know, the balancing act is the trade-off between real fiscal cost versus effort. I mean, you said, you know, developers aren't cheap. This saves a lot of developer time and it's, it particularly saves a lot of DevOps and admin, you know, server admin time because that's abstracted away from you. They're managing it, they're running the service, they're tuning them, they're, you know, they're, uh, you know, there's all these add-ons for log management. You know, you can tie it into all these things like Splunk and Paper Trail and uh, other ones that I've forgotten the name of uh, that probably end in .ly. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's that trade-off between, you know, people cost versus running cost. You know, the, the overall uh, running costs of any system is a combination of these factors, you know, and Heroku is no different in that respect. Richard. It's very easy to share Heroku apps with other people as well when it's free. What I've done is how do I monetize? If I build something that's a killer app for, say, I build my own content management solution, how do I, I know I can publish it, but yep. how can I monetize it? Is there like a app exchange? Is there a revenue share model? How does that work? Uh, I, I admit I'm, I'm less familiar with that. Certainly in terms of the, you know, when you, when you talk about the parallels to app exchange, there is a healthy community of add-ons for, you know, if you've developed a, a fantastic uh, content management, image asset management system for, for Heroku, then yes, absolutely, you know, the, the Heroku uh, add-ons ecosystem is, is the right place for that. If you've done something that's a, a full fat, um, application that, that you know that you think you, you want to monetize you would generally monetize that as the same as, as any other web application the difference is, is that you know you're hosting it on Heroku so if you look at something like uh, I've got to think of a, a, a good example now suppose you've, you've done an, a, an application that's the next great social network for, for want of a better example or, or the next great you know Instagram or, or you know anything where people you know you're going to get high traffic high usage um, and you want to do a subscription model off of that then yeah absolutely do that but whether you host that on Heroku whether you host that on AWS or your own server farm or whatever um, it's largely material that's that's your running costs the, the monetization becomes on how you run your business that's down to me to collect my own revenues, yeah. yeah but if you've if you've developed something that that services other Heroku developers architects, you know, the Heroku ecosystem, then yes, it's much more of the, the app exchange model. Any more for any more? Todd? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, what's, what's bad with Heroku? Like, we've heard lots of good stuff. When, what, <laughs> what isn't good, do you think? Is there anything you've come across where you've gone, I wish I knew this before I ventured down the Heroku path? And uh, let, me, let, let me pick that up in, in reverse order. Um, so things I'd wish I'd known when I made my first um, Heroku app, all of this scalability stuff. Uh, it was really when I started uh, A, studying for the Heroku architecture exam, uh, and B, going through a series of interviews for a, a job where they wanted a Heroku architect. And I thought, oh, I could do that. I know a bit of Heroku. And I started reading up and thought, holy shit, there's a whole lot more to this. You know, like the Kafka stuff, the 12-factor model, um, the, you know, the elastic skin, you know, I just basically just wrote a Java app and threw it at Heroku as somewhere to host it, which is completely the wrong approach. You know, you need to, you need to think about scale from day one. So to answer the what I'd wish I'd known, uh, that's that piece. In terms of the downsides, uh, honestly, hand on heart, from a technical aspect, I haven't found one. Um, from a cost perspective, yeah, absolutely. If you're, if you're doing enterprise grade, yeah, it's, it's not the cheapest tool in the tool bag. Um, but as I said to the gentleman at the front here, you know, you've got to weigh that off against how much developer DevOps admin time are you saving? You know, I don't need to hire a server admin to run swapmyswag.com because Heroku are doing that for me. I just need to do, write the code, test it, git push, done. So yeah, it's, um, you know, enterprise cost is, is probably the downside. Um, at a technical fundamental, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to hear about technical challenges people have had with Heroku, but I've, I've not found one. I think it's not just the technical problems that you may have, but I think it's more of understanding um, how a distributed system would work. Yeah. Because you would uh, like to write everything in a, in a model which is worker data. Right? 
So basically writing something which are comp which is compa compatibilized. So it works and it's written smaller to compromise and basically you're not really yourself. So yeah. I think that's a challenge which uh, possibly somebody coming from sales to voice directly would face initially. Yeah. But if you were coming from Google Cloud Platform, AWS, um, you know, any of these sort of Docker container hosts that, that are out there, and you know, you're used to that model, you'll fit right in. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Alrighty. Thank you very much. <laughs>